All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started on our very last mother sauce, Sauce Espanol, which is a brown stock thickened with a brown roux. Um, so really like this dish. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So uh, for the ingredients, you're going to need half of a carrot. I'll slice this in half. Half of a yellow onion. Two tablespoons or one ounce of butter. One ounce or two tablespoons of flour. Two cups or 16 ounces of roasted brown stock, which I've got here. Our culinary arts class started making that uh, yesterday. Two tablespoons or one eighth of a cup of tomato paste. One teaspoon of minced garlic, or you just use one garlic clove. Uh, kosher salt and pepper. Okay. For the Salisbury steak itself, you're going to need uh, 12 ounces of ground beef. Now, if you want to just make it easy for yourself when you buy ingredients at the store, uh, you can easily go with one pound to make it easier for measurements. Uh, one fourth of a cup of breadcrumbs, one teaspoon of ketchup, one teaspoon of mustard, couple dashes of Worcestershire sauce. Let me just zoom in real quick. So this is Worcestershire or Worcestershire. I actually don't fully know how it's pronounced, but this, you're going to need this. Okay. If you've never had Worcestershire sauce before, it's basically a really savory uh, sort of sauce that you can use. Um, adds a very meaty umami flavor to this. Um, I'm also going to kind of cheat a little bit here, and I'm going to be going with a crushed up, half of a crushed up beef bouillon cube. That is completely optional, but that is up to you. Some kosher salt and pepper just to uh, season the beef with. Uh, about a teaspoon or so of vegetable oil just for cooking the Salisbury steaks. And then eight ounces or half of a package of egg noodles. Now you can serve this over mashed potatoes, uh, polenta, rice, a bunch of different things. Uh, today I'm just going to be doing it with egg noodle pasta. All right, so real quick, um, two things. One, you can easily scale up this recipe, uh, double it up or triple it if you want to feed more people here. The other thing here is, just like in previous recipes, you can customize the flavors. Again, things such as your mirepoix, like carrots, onions, uh, these different sauces and spices, you can definitely customize that for your own personal tastes. Um, so just understand the difference between a functional ingredient, such as our flour and our butter to make the roux, and some of the main ingredients, such as obviously the beef and noodles and stuff like that. At the end of the day, you can play around with this quite a bit, all right? So the first step we're gonna do is we're going to finely chop the carrot and the onion. That is going to be cut into a brunoise. So here for my onion, I'm just going to peel the paper back a little bit. I, once again, I have my stem end, my root end. To cut this into a brunoise, I'm going to cut the stem end off, cut right down the center. I'm going to peel back the onion. Now, easiest way to do it, rather than try to peel back all the little bits of paper here, is just take the top layer and just peel the whole thing right off. Yes, you do lose a little bit as far as yield, but for what you make up for in time, it's usually worth it. Okay, clean off my board real quick so there's no physical contaminants there. Okay, from there, uh, just like I did for the last lab, for the um, sauce velote, I'm going to just cut right through, going almost all the way to the root. Then slice up the onion. Okay, and then from there, I'm going to finely chop this. Now, when I start to uh, get to my root end here, when it's coming a little wobbly to stay stable, I can just simply turn that over and then just cut around 
the root end there. Okay, and as far as these pieces, I'm just going to finely chop right through. There we go. Okay, now that is my onion. I'm gonna slide that to the side. Now for the carrot, I'm going to top and tail this, and I'm also going to peel it. I realized after I topped and tailed it that, uh, yeah, it needs to be peeled. Now I'm just going to slice that, and I know I said in the uh, beginning to use half of a carrot. I'm going to use a little bit more just because I like the kind of texture and the flavor of carrots, especially when it comes to beef. Um, but again, up to you. All right, so now uh, after I've taken my piece, I'm gonna slice the carrot in half. In order to finally dice this, I'm going to cut into thirds. So there's one cut, there's the other. I'm turn this 90 degrees, and then I'm just gonna finally chop that into brunoise. There we go. So now part of that same step is I'm going to uh, cook this on medium high heat for about five or 10 minutes or so until the vegetables are golden brown. So let me switch you over right now. When it comes to reinforcing flavors here, we're gonna be adding a little bit more mirepoix here. We got carrots, uh, we got onions. Now you can add celery to this, no problem. But just like when we were making a brown stock, we used brown roux, we also want to use brown vegetables. Uh, that reinforces that roasted flavor, uh, roast that kind of caramelizes the sugars, that will be part of our sauce. So I'm laying this charge with heat. Now I have this on high heat. Unlike the chicken velote, where I was doing that over low heat and sweating the uh, onions, ser uh, celery, and carrots, this time I have the heat really, really high because I want to actually brown the vegetables in this. Okay, so I have this in the highest heat possible. Once my butter is melted just enough to coat the bottom, I'm gonna add in my carrots and onion right in. You should hear them fizzle right away. Now to this, I am gonna make sure that I season them with a good, generous pinch of kosher salt. Not only because you want to season the vegetables, but salt has this property to be able to pull out moisture and water out of ingredients, whether it's protein or vegetables. So by doing this, we'll cook out the water in the vegetables a little bit quicker and help it brown a little bit sooner. So I'm going to cut back when these are nice and golden brown. So you can see my vegetables have browned quite a bit here. So I'm going to add in my flour. Now remember, this is a brown sauce, brown stock that can make brown roux. So after we get our flour in and it's coated the vegetables, I'm gonna turn on my heat just a little bit, but now I'm going to cook the flour until it's browned a bit. So. It's a little hard to see on the vegetables themselves, so you have to make sure to look closely here. When all the little bits of flour get to be, get a little dark, a little toasted, you'll start to kind of smell it. It's almost gonna smell a little bit like burnt popcorn, but in a good way, as weird as that may sound. Okay, uh, you'll see it'll stick to the bottom of the pan a little bit, that is fine. All right, so I'm gonna let that cook for just a minute or two until my brown roux is formed. So while you're browning this, it's almost like a small game of chicken. You know, you wanna build that flavor as much as possible and toast the roux here. But the more you do it, the more you risk burning it. But if you don't cook it enough, you don't build really much flavor in there. So it's a little, it's a little nerve wracking, but it should be all right. Okay, once I see that the uh, flour is toasted. 
now we're going to go through the same process we do whenever we are adding any sort of liquid to a roux. I'm going to do it slowly and bit by bit. So I got my brown stock right here. Just going to add a little bit and just stir that in. Okay, now I got a little bit in. I'll add a little bit more. Now it's also nice about adding liquid to this pan is you see all the browned bits on the bottom of on the pan right here. Okay, all of that is caramelized sugars and bits and pieces that have come up from the vegetables. Now all of that is caramelized flavor. However, most people just they cook something in a pan and then they just throw the pan in the sink and then they clean it. However, good cooks will find a way to get it off the bottom of the pan. And the way you do that is through what's called deglazing. Now deglazing is basically where you take a liquid, you pour it into the pan that has all those caramelized bits on the bottom, and you basically release it from the pan and bring it into the sauce. So not only does it make cleanup easier, but it also you know, releases all of those caramelized bits into your sauce making the sauce way more flavorful. Okay, for those of you who are here in person, uh, when we were making the brown stock, you guys saw that process firsthand. So I'm taking my whisk and I'm just kinda, almost like scrubbing and cleaning the bottom of the pan to release all those little brown, brown bits. So you see, almost there's less of it now. And now I'll keep adding my stock. And so I'm going to slowly add in my stock and I'm going to bring it to a boil. The rest of my stock goes in. That looks good. Okay, and now I'm going to bring this up to a boil. Then I'm going to just reduce the heat to a bare simmer and let this cook for about five to ten minutes. Ideal In an ideal world, you at least cook this for 20 but we may not have the time here, so cook it for at least five to 10 minutes. Just allow it to thicken, and then you're going to taste and adjust the seasoning. So make sure you're whisking that uh, pretty consistently here, and we'll wait for the sauce to thicken up. All right, now that our sauce is up to a boil there, I'm gonna reduce the heat a little bit. Now. Here is kind of an optional step, but it really does help the sauce out quite a bit. As you'll see here, as the sauce comes up to a boil, there's gonna be a lot of this kind of foam and fat that just kind of gets thrown off the sauce here. Now, in sock making, this is scum, it's coagulated protein as well as fat. Now, you could leave this in your sauce. However, the sauce will kind of have a broken, greasy mouth feel to it. Not to mention it just won't have a nice clean flavor. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my my pot, which is right now on the center of the burner. You probably noticed it was slightly off center. So that way the bubbles are coming up on one side and all that scum and all that fat is gonna collect on one side. I'm just gonna take a ladle and just skim that right off. So now my sauce has a lot less fat in there, is a little bit more clean. And this is generally best practice whenever you're making any sort of stock. Stock should not have much fat in there in of itself. And sometimes you can get a broken sauce with a greasy mouthfeel. Now you'll see as the sauce comes up to a boil, it will thicken up a bit. Now, that does not mean that just because stock does not have fat in it does not mean you can't put fat in there. After all, we're cooking this with a roux. Um, however, you want to just be, you want to add fat in your own way. You don't want it just kind of greased up, you know, sitting, pooling at the top there, okay? Um, one way to enrich this sauce while keeping it emulsified is to add a little bit of cream. You can do that. After the sauce is finished cooking, you can do that. But um, for me, I'm just going to skim that off and serve this as is. So um, yeah, from here, I'm just going to put it back on the burner 
and I'm going to set my timer for about 10 minutes, in which case the sauce will thicken up and we'll be ready to go on to our next step. Okay. All right, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and form my Salisbury steaks. Now, Salisbury steaks are not actually steaks. They are rather just kind of patties that are formed using a bunch of different spices and seasonings. Okay, so for the Salisbury steaks, I'm going to add in all of my other ingredients that I have not used so far. So uh, the breadcrumbs, the ketchup, mustard, a couple of dashes of Worcestershire, all that stuff. So let me first season it pretty generously with some kosher salt. And beef really, really, really loves flavor of black pepper. So don't be afraid to add that there. Okay. Um, personal favorite is also adding garlic powder. In fact, I should probably add some here, but uh, again, that's up to you. I'll also break up my beef bouillon cube. Again, this is cheating a little bit in that you're using almost a powdered, you know, flavored salt in this, but I don't mind cheating here. All right, so adding that in crushed. Okay, my breadcrumbs my mustard couple dashes of Worcestershire sauce it's probably a little too much but that's okay didn't expect it to come out of the bottle so quickly um, and then any other seasonings you'd like to add here. Then what you're going to do is you're just going to simply combine this. Have any of you have ever made uh, homemade meatballs before? Uh, you can, do, it's the same process. Just get your hands in there, just kind of fold the meat. You're not really squeezing it, but rather just kind of folding it together until it's a even homogenized mixture. You can add any sort of fresh herbs to this, any sort of thyme, rosemary, parsley, completely up to you. All right, so once I have that pretty well combined, I'm going to then go to my next step, which is to form my patties. Now from here, I'm just gonna take, probably divide this into four pieces, roughly. Okay, uh, give or take. Uh, Taylor, for this one, I'll just go with three. So again, divide accordingly. Okay, so from here, you're just going to press it flat, and almost like you're forming a burger patty. Okay, just press that flat into just kind of a, almost the size of a playing card. Okay, now again, you can form it into burger patties, so on. In fact, this actually makes a pretty good filling for a sandwich. Okay, so once that is formed, I will then go over to cooking these. All right, now we got to cook our uh, Salisbury steaks. Now, here you see two different pans. On the left, you have a non-stick pan, and then on the right, you have a regular stainless steel saute pan. Now, you can cook this in either or, but which one is better? Well, depends on what you're doing, okay? A non-stick pan is really, really good for foods that, as the name implies, you don't wanna stick to it. So things such as fish, eggs, uh, proteins that will definitely have a tendency, of, uh, tendency to stick, this is the pan for you, okay? Um, and it's also easier to clean, just overall, its main thing is that it doesn't stick. The problem is that you won't get quite as much browning and, and caramelization with this. Okay? It's just in its nature. However, a stainless steel pan is really good at developing a crust, developing browning, and helping you build flavorful sauces. The problem is that it wants to stick to proteins. The reason why, if you look at the pan on a very microscopic level, it basically kind of almost looks like my fingers here. Got a bunch of peaks and valleys in it. And all those peaks and valleys is where, well, let me just kind of bring my hand to focus here. Okay, all those peaks and valleys is where the meat will stick to the pan and kind of scorch and 
create a hard time. Now, you can make this problem better by adding oil, which then fills in all those little gaps that then the meat will float right on top. But again, you still kind of have that problem of a bunch of peaks and valleys. But we want the browning that comes with this pan. So what do you do? Well, here what I've done is this pan has been on the flame for about five to six minutes now. Hold on, I just noticed one problem. Yeah. Probably a good idea to never have something flammable right next to the stove. So anyway, like I was saying, um, I've been heating this pan or charging it with heat for about five to six minutes. Now, what that does is it takes all those little peaks and valleys and it closes them up. So now you have a completely flat surface to cook stuff on. Let me show you. Right here, I have a little bit of water, okay? If I were to take my fingers and just dip it right into here and then go right into the pan, what do you think is gonna happen? Take a moment for you to answer that. Now, most of you would say, it'll sizzle, right? Well, let's do that. As you can see, it doesn't do that. In fact, the water just forms into beads and literally will just bounce around the pan, which is kind of cool. When you think about it, the reason why it does that is because there's so, the top surface of this pan is so flat and so closed that there's nothing for the water to even, you know, catch onto and, you know, evaporate. So you have a pan that nothing's gonna stick to. Now, if I did that exact same thing with my non-stick pan that's been charging for a little bit, it beads up a little bit, but you hear it right away, it sizzles. I try to move it a little bit, and it just still kind of sizzles, and most of the water didn't really go anywhere. And see, it's evaporated already. Whereas over here, you see that little droplet is still bouncing around, okay? so. The key is whenever you're using a stainless steel pan is to let the pan charge with heat for a little bit before you put anything in there. Not only will you get a better crust, but then things will uh, keep from sticking. Oh, and just one cautionary note, whereas a stainless steel pan, you can you know, heat up quite a bit. A non-stick pan, if you, you do not want to overheat this, especially if you have pets. If you heat this pan up and you're noticing with nothing in there, there's kind of smoke and fumes coming off of it, turn off the heat immediately, okay? Um, non-stick pans, you're not supposed to heat them up beyond like 500 degrees because if you do, there'll be toxic fumes that come off of it that are toxic not only to you, but especially to pets. And if you have any pet birds, if they're exposed to those fumes, they will die. Okay, and that's not an exaggeration either, so definitely be careful with these. But we are going to be going with our stainless steel pan here. So, I'm going to take my oil. Now, I do have my pan probably a little too hot here. You can see the smoke coming in. Now, I'm going to basically just fry my beef patties, and I'm just going to, when I place it in, I'm going to lay it away from me. There you go. Okay, my next one. And again. Okay, now my pan, again, like I said, is probably a little too hot. That's okay, I've actually completely turned off the heat, and as you see, there's still plenty of heat uh, to cook that. All right, so now from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this cook, uh, cook for a minute or two on one side, I'll flip it over, and then I'll let it cook for another minute or two until the center of the meat is cooked all the way through. If you wanna go for a medium rare or medium steak, cook it anywhere between three uh, or 135 degrees and 145. Do keep in mind that Surf Safe does require that you cook any sort of ground meat product to 155, but again, you take the risks that you want to take with your own food, so. All right, and there we go. So my steaks are nice and brown. You see a nice even brown. It's gonna be really, really tasty. So I'm gonna take those out of the pan here. Okay. Now with the excess oil here, 
I'm just gonna kind of drain that off. Here, pour that off here. Now you see there's still some little brown bits here. Uh, your steaks may have more or less depending on, you know, just like depending on a bunch of factors. What you can do now is you can deglaze the pan with, with your sauce that's already made. So, not only does that also reheat your sauce, but now all those bits and pieces of caramelized steak that have stuck to the bottom here are nice and incorporate into the sauce now. All right, now we are ready to plate up. So quick review here, as far as cooking any sort of pasta, I have my water up at a rolling boil. I have seasoned it quite generously uh, with salt. I am gonna just add a little bit more here, okay. And now with the water at a boil, I'm gonna add in my pasta and super important during this first few minutes to make sure that you are stirring the pasta quite a bit. After the first minute or two and the pasta is not really going to stick uh, that badly or there's little chance of it happening but just make sure you bring your water back up to a boil. So uh, that will take anywhere from 7 to 10 minutes. You just have to look at the directions on your pasta. Um, if you rather make mashed potatoes, you can do that as well. All right, so uh, we'll let that cook and we'll go to our next step. All right, so now we plate this up. We take our steak, just simply put it right on the center of the plate over our noodles. And then from there, just take our sauce espagnole and then just ladle that right over the top. So a little bit just to kind of overflow the sides of the steak, and then just enough to kind of coat the pasta here. Again, this goes well with any sort of starch that you want to add to this. Rice, pasta, uh, mashed potatoes, you, what have you. So again, just wipe down the edge of the plate. And then I'll just add some chopped chives just right on top. And there we have it. All right, so there is our last mother sauce with sauce espanol. So a brown stock thickened with a brown roux and we've covered all our mother sauces. Great, congrats guys. So um, if you have any questions, of course, just let me know. Um, for those of you who are gonna be here in person, uh, let me know if you uh, want any variations um, or if you want to add other ingredients to this let me know so I can have those ordered for you all right um, but that is it uh, if you have any questions just let me know